Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this evening's lecture by Professor Timothy Snyder. The lecture opens a meeting of the German-Ukrainian Commission of Historians, and it takes place under the auspices of the Institute's new program on Ukraine in European Dialogue. This is a program initiated by Tim Snyder and is organized, as many of you know, by Tanya Shushenko. Let me welcome especially the members of the commission and the two chairmen of the commission, Professor Martin Schulze Wessels, who is the chairman from the German side, and the historian, Professor Yaroslav Haritsak, who is an alumnus of the IWM and is the chairman on the Ukrainian side. The uh, Deutsche Ukrainische Historica Kommission has started its work beginning last year, and its mission is to create institutional links between German and Ukrainian historiographies, foster academic exchange between the two countries and also beyond, and raise historical awareness in general. And as those of you who know the region and the problems at the moment with contestations of the past, you will realize that this is not only something of academic value, but something of very, very strong political relevance as well. I'm happy to announce also that the program of our meeting and the conference takes place tomorrow, so you're welcome to attend sessions of it as well include interactions with the future members of the Austrian-Ukrainian Commission of Historians, which is currently in the making. With that, let me turn to uh, this evening's lecture. Actually, Tim Snyder needs no introduction. He doesn't need an introduction anywhere, least in Vienna, and even less at the IWM. And nevertheless, as host and uh, as a friend, I really think Curtsy deserves that I should say just a few words, not because you don't know him, but I think that an event like this is important enough that we recall some of the achievements of Tim's with which the IWM is very closely associated and extremely proud of. Tim came here as a junior fellow. He is now one of our permanent fellows. He's a professor at the University of Yale and has been a fellow in, has held fellowships in Paris, in Vienna, in Warsaw, and an academy scholarship at Harvard. I'm not going to list all of his books because that's going to eat into his time, but let me just recall the two books with which the IWM is equally closely associated. Much of them uh, were written here at the Institute. Bloodlands, which has won 12 awards. I think it's been translated by now into 33 languages. And his most recent book, Black Earth, The Holocaust is Writing and Warning, which will appear in 24 foreign editions and is a bestseller in as many countries as Bloodlands. Both the books have won numerous awards. And you have heard him give lectures based on these books here on many an occasion. The subject of tonight's lecture is something new and something different. It's titled The Ancient Inn is the Modern, the History of the East Slavic Lands in the Light of the Myths of Contemporary War. And without further ado, I would just like to invite Tim Snyder to address you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Shalini, for that very kind introduction. I, I, I think, of course, um, as you do, of, of the IVUM as an institution, but I also think of, of the Institute as a group of friends and, uh, and in its own way as a forum for discussion. We're, we're scholars here, but we're also people who are trying to think our way across disciplines and to find our way across different national cultures into new ways of understanding the present and the past. So what in that spirit
spirit, I'm, I'm going to be doing something this evening which goes well beyond the mandate of the German-Ukrainian Historical Commission, which, as you can judge from the accent, I am not a member. I cannot be a member constitutionally. I am a historian, but I'm neither German nor, nor, nor Ukrainian. Um, so being happily free of the constraints of, um, of, of, of German and U U Ukrainian history and the attempt to bring them together, what I'd like to do with you instead is to think for the next 45 minutes or an hour about the past, about what we've been doing to the past, about what the past means to us. Um, so in, instead, of, instead of a simple confrontation of myth or, or, or memory with what historians take to be historical reality, what I'd like to do is instead think aloud with you about where we are now, what our chronotope is, how the past in a certain way is collapsing before our eyes, and what that means for the present, what that means for, for the future. So let me start with the title. In the title I say, the ancient is the modern. And of course, that's, that's a reference to the, the famous discussion in late 17th century France between the so-called ancients and the so-called moderns, where um, you know, a, a, after the Renaissance, after the Reformation, uh, a discussion was held as to which was more virtuous, which was truer, which was more imaginative, um, the, 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 the old or, or, or the new. Um, what, of course, in that argument, the people arguing for the new always have a certain advantage, which is what they know what the old was. What I want to claim here um, with, with this, this talk under the title, The Ancient is the Modern, what I want to claim here is that we seem to be doing something rather new with the past. Um, us across the culture, I'm going to be talking about specifically Russia and a little bit about Ukraine, but across the culture, I think we're doing something very new with the past. And to try to draw your attention to it, let me, let me speak for a moment about a different phenomenon. It's hard to have a past when you don't have a future. And if you look at the mass culture and the way the mass culture operates, right, I'm sure many of you are even more innocent of mass culture than, than, than I am. But if you think of the way science fiction has changed, science fiction used to be about what would be possible in the future. Science fiction is now almost entirely about the catastrophe of the future. If you think about popular films, popular films now have two plots. One of them is we must stop the catastrophe from happening, and the other is the catastrophe has already happened, right? Those are the two plots that are now available in Hollywood. Okay, I mean, I fell in love with my mother is probably also available, but th those are the two dominant plots in, in Hollywood today. Um, our, our imagination of the future has essentially emptied out, right? Anyone who reads Russian or Ukrainian novels, as well as American or British novels, also knows what I'm talking about. Um, and, and so we're left with the past. But what sort of past are we left with? It seems to me that we're facing a kind of compression of time. If you can't see the future stretching out before you um, latitudinally, if you can't see it as a kind of a line which extends forever, I think it also becomes hard to see the past in that way. I think the past compresses, the past becomes a kind of landscape where you pick and choose different things which might seem useful to you at a certain time. You use the past to solve problems of the present without maybe realizing that that's, that that's what you're doing. Okay. Now, I say all of this just to sort of stretch out our minds a little bit. That was the introductory yoga before the exercise of the talk. Just to stretch out our minds a little bit before the claims that I want to make about Russia, Ukraine, and the war. Because what I'm keen to do here is to get beyond <clears throat> our, our, our habits of talking about memory, right? I think we've reached a point inside the European Union where every time you use the word memory, you should be fined five euros, right? And then that money should be used to fund historical research, right? Excuse me for the like partisan approach to that subject, but that's what I believe. I, the, when, we, when we talk about memory, we get, we, we're usually making one of, one of three moves. Um, one move that we're making is a kind of relativism. Right? So if, for example, um, a Russian president says something about the deep past, right? he says that, for example, the reason we need to invade Crimea is that, um, that there was a conversion of a Russian king a thousand years ago, um, we might say, in our relativist move, we might say, well, you have your myths, we have our myths. Right? That's one response. So then history dissolves into our own various random commitments about the past. Another move that we make is memory determinism, 
right? We say, well, <clears throat> whether or not it's true that a Russian king converted to Christianity in Crimea a thousand years ago, whether or not it's true, they think it's true, and they act accordingly, and therefore let's assume that is why they're doing what they're doing, right? So again, there's no history involved here. It's all psychology. They have a kind of commitment. They're determined to do what, what they're doing. And then another move, the one which is closest to my own heart, and which I will admit to, ma to making rather often, I mean probably more than once daily, is memory dismissal. When someone tell you hear a story about memory and you say as a historian, that's not true, right? And I think that has a certain value, but I also want to try to get beyond that. What I want to do is, rather than stopping at the claim um, that these, these various myths and memories are not true, right? Rather than stopping there, I'd like to try to encounter them in a more serious way and ask what happens if <clears throat> we take the historical reference not as an invitation to relativism or determinism or dismissal, but instead as an invitation to think about how the past works inside a political system or an intellectual system which is different than our own. Okay, what do I mean? First is the reference. Now, I've already mentioned the reference a couple of times. I'm going to spend this entire talk talking about a single historical reference, although I'll be happy to entertain others. In a way, it doesn't matter which reference you choose. I just happen to like this one in, in particular because it's a nice round thousand years ago, and you should always use round numbers wherever possible. So the, 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 the reference that I'm referring to, I've already referred to, is the, the justification that President Vladimir Putin gave for the Russian invasion of southern Ukraine and the subsequent occupation and then annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. Namely that there was once a Russian ruler called, he wouldn't have said Volodymyr, he would have said Vladimir. Um, at the time, people would have said something closer to Volodymyr. I'm going to say Volodymyr. Um, that there was a Russian leader called Volodymyr, that Volodymyr converted to Christianity on the Crimean Peninsula. And therefore, it makes perfect sense that Russian armies and Russian power would now be present roughly a thousand years on. Now, um, what I want to say, first of all, is that as, 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 as analysts of politics, um, we can look upon this statement and see how it solves a political problem in a fairly straightforward way. Right? We might not be convinced of this, but we can see how this works to solve two, I would say, basic problems in, in Russia today, or in Russia in 2014 when this happened. The first is domestic. What's the basic political problem in Russia today? I mean, those of you from Russia may have different opinions. I, I would say that the fundamental political problem in Russia today is the lack of a succession principle. I mean, not just the absence of a plausible successor to President Putin, but the lack of a principle that would legitimate that succession. It seems to me that's the central issue. That's the unspoken obsession, right? And how do you solve a problem like that? One way to solve it is to refer to an endlessly coherent history, right? A thousand years of Russian history going back, you know, into the mists of time to another leader who conveniently has the same first name that you do. What could be more elegant than, than, than that, right? And the second obvious problem in Russian foreign, is in Russian foreign relations. The second obvious problem is why did it make sense to destroy the European order? Okay? That's actually a fairly straight, that's a fairly important question. If, you are, if you're the Russian Federation and you have the longest land borders in the world, it's not obvious why you would undermine the principle of territorial sovereignty. If the Russian Federation and your most important economic and political partner is Europe, it's not obvious why you would want to mess up the legal order that unites you with Europe, right? Um, if you're a Russian real, pol real politician, if you're thinking in terms of interests, it's not obvious why you'd want to push your country towards a more or less definite entanglement with China forever, right? These are, it's, it's not obvious. And so one way to solve this problem, as it were, is to think not in terms of interests or economics um, or law, but to think instead of nations and history and to recategorize all of this as a national problem which has to be solved. So Crimea is our national problem, it's our national destiny, a thousand years of history and so on and so forth, and you know, the European order, in effect, be damned. Now at this level, right, anyone who knows anything about European history will recognize the flavor of this solution, will recognize the genre of this solution. It's something called Bonapartism. 
right? When you have domestic political problems, um, when you're kind of a Democrat but not completely a Democrat, um, when you're kind of an emperor but not completely an emperor, uh, when nationalism already exists but you don't know quite what to do with it, what do you do? You invade some other country in the name of national self-determination. This is a strategy which was invented um, by, by Bonaparte in the middle of the 19th century, um, and it works, right? And the Russians are not the only people who practice it, right? We practice it too. Many countries still practice it. I think that's a fair enough explanation for what happens in 2014. But what I want to try to, and it, and it makes perfect sense. It's, it, it's sufficient, I think, as an explanation at a certain level. But what it lacks is a kind of internal Russian perspective. That is, you could say, and people say this to me all the time, and I'm sure someone will say it to, say it to me in question and answer. I know that because I've planted the person who's going to ask this question. Um, someone will always say, like, isn't this all calculation? Isn't it just naked politics? Are you really sure that history and ideology matters? Right? <clears throat> and maybe... You know, maybe it doesn't, maybe this is sufficient, but I think it, it, in addition to the cynical Bonapartist description of what's happening, it's very good to have a Russian perspective. I mean, if you're going to try to explain how this, this reference to the past overcomes the essential problems of both Russian domestic and foreign policy, I think it makes sense to imagine that there might be some intellectual and some emotional commitments involved, that there's something beyond just a simple calculation. And if you'll bear with me on that assumption, let me try to give you a clearer sense of what I'm talking about. Now, I'm now going to do the part where I talk about early East Slavic history, which I take it is, is, is justified um, on its own, right? I take it that everyone here would like nothing more than to hear an entire hour of early East Slavic history with the exception of my historian colleagues, who will immediately say, Snyder, that's not your field, right? With the exception of them, I'm sure everyone would be delighted to hear an hour of East, early East Slavic history. Before I give you the East Slavic history, though, let me, give you, let me try to be clear again about why I'm doing this. Um, why I'm doing this is not to say that the Russians have it all wrong and therefore it's irrelevant. It's not to say they have their myths and we have our myths. It's to say that the difference between Russian memory, if you insist, and history is a window into something more important. It's a window into ideology. It's a window into a political system. Okay, so now let me do the familiar exercise where the historian says the politicians have the past wrong. So when President Putin refers to um, Volodymyr, the conversion of, of Kiev and Rus in, in 988, there, there are certain things um, which the colleagues will all know, but which are interesting. I'm going to dwell on them for a moment. When Volodymyr ruled Kiev, right, he ruled the state called Kiev in Rus, Moscow did not exist as a city. Right? It's not going to exist for another 300 years or so. So you, there can't, you can't think of that as a Russian unit in, the moder in any kind of modern sense because M Moscow, the center of Russian history, didn't exist. The word Russia, which was invented right, um, to cover the much earlier word Rus. What is Rus? What is the word Rus? Um, Rus is a... Uh, Finnish word for Swedes. Okay, so um, now now Russia is not alone in this kind of like catastrophic misnaming of self, right? My country is named after an Italian map maker, right? And we're stuck with that forever. There's nothing we can do, right? Just like Russia is named after an old, you know, dialectical Finnish word for Swedes. At this point, we're stuck with these names. We're going to insist on them. We're going to claim they make sense. But for the purpose of history. It's worth knowing, why was it a Finnish name for Swedes? Because the people who founded the state we call Rus were slave trading Vikings who were making their way first down the Volga and then later down the Dnipro, um, looking, for trade right, looking for trade routes. The rulers, um, these Scandinavians, and when they set up this trading post um, around Kiev that eventually became a state called Kiev and the Rus, or Rus at the time, Kiev and the Rus is a name that came later, the rulers were first called Kagans, they were called Kagans because the most important polity next to them was Hazaria, right? Um, the Hazars were a Kaganate. Their rulers were called Kagans. The Hazars are most famous as being the people who converted uh, either to Christianity or to Judaism or to Islam, right? And for centuries, it was actually unclear which of these it was. It now appears that they converted to Judaism. We have some, we have some documents. So there actually was a Jewish state between the fall of the temple and, and in modern Israel, of course, at the, the moment they converted to 
Judaism, they disappeared from history. The conclusions from that I leave, I leave to you. Um, but the point is that we're in a very complicated moment of cultural synthesis in which the Slavic element is present, but is far from dominant. The people who rule Rus when they die, they're buried with their arms, they're buried with their horses, they're buried with their slave girls. The, the merchants from the city, when they die, they're, married, they're buried with amulets of Thor, um, but also with Khazar jewelry, right? The conversion, when it happens, is in 957, the first one. is carried out by a female ruler called Olha, um, basically for political reasons. She does what everyone does in Eastern Europe in the Middle Ages, which is the sort of dance of east to west. So now, like, we have Poland, and Poland is always western, and we have the Russians, and they're always eastern Christianity. When the conversions happened, it was all politics. So the moment you converted to one thing, you immediately asked for missionaries from the other thing, and you just kept going back and forth until you got the best deal possible. And everyone essentially did this. So Olha converts to Eastern Christianity, what we now call, and immediately asks for missionaries from Germany because she wants to see if the Germans have a better deal in terms of Christianity. It was all politics. Her son, um, her son uh, Sviatoslav, uh, who was a warrior and a wanderer, refused to convert to Christianity because, and this, these are basically his words, because it wasn't cool enough. Um, he, said that, he said, all of my friends will make fun of me if I convert to Christianity. His drujina, like the guys who made war with him, he said, they will all make fun of me if I convert. Mom, I can't convert to Christianity. It's just not cool enough. He's eventually ambushed by the Pechenegs in 972 who make a, a drinking cup from his skull, um, as was, as was you know, the habit at the time. So this is where Vladimir comes into history, Vladimir, Volodymyr. Um, Volo there's a very complicated succession struggle at that point. Volodymyr wins in the succession struggle. Among other things, he kills his half-brother. Um, and what does he do? Does he convert to Christianity? He eventually gets around to converting Christianity, but not before first establishing a, a public cult around the thunder god and sacrificing Christian after Christian to the thunder god. Um, uh, around 90, somewhere in the 980s, he marries the sister of the Byzantine emperor, which more or less requires him politically to convert to Christianity, which he does. And so his public right, which involved the thunder god and sacrificing Christians, then became a public right, which involved Christians not being sacrificed, right? But it, it, was, it was a public religion. It, was, it essentially had a political purpose. Now, Volodymyr, although he did wonderful things, did not have um, a succession logic. Um, he was concerned about what his sons would do. When, when he dies, one of his sons is in prison, um, and he's marching to kill another one of his sons, Yaroslav, um, in 1015 when he dies. Then there's another very complicated succession struggle. Um, three of the sons are murdered. There are seven years of war. There are ten years of civil strife. Um, and when Yaroslav is the only son left alive, that's when the succession struggle is over. There's still no Moscow, by the way, in case anyone is wondering. There's still no city of Moscow. Um, there are 800 years of the history of Kiev without Moscow. Everyone from Ukraine knows that. Um, now, so I'm not going to go into like how complicated the succession struggles are. There are some extremely long and wonderful German books which are devoted entirely to this subject, the succession struggles. What I'm going to do is leap forward boldly to 1241. 1241 is an important date in the way that um, people look back at Kiev and Rus, because 1241 is when the Mongols come rushing in, and there is nothing more convenient for the history of a European state than Mongols rushing in, right? Because Mongols rushing in gives you an excuse for anything, right? As soon as Mongols come rushing in, you can basically blame them for everything. So the story that Russians and also Ukrainians tell is that the Kievan Rus was brought to a sad end because the Mongols came rushing in, right? Okay, that didn't actually happen. Kievan Rus was a complete mess because of the succession problems a hundred years before the Mongols arrived. When the, when the Kievan Rus princes tried to fight the Mongols, they actually ended up quarreling with themselves on the way to the battlefield. That's how bad things, that's how bad things were. So basically this whole business of the Mongols is a, is a lovely 13th century excuse for why the state actually had fragmented long before then. And I'm emphasizing why there was no principle of succession as we understand it in the modern sense. When the Mongols come, the territory of Old Rus is divided up into basically three zones. The first of them is where there's going to be Moscow. There isn't Moscow yet, in case you're keeping track, but there's going to be Moscow, and that's in the northeast. It's called Suzdal. There's a central region. Um, the central region is going to be governed by something called the, the, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, and there's a western region called Galicia Volinia. Um, so the territorial succession, most of the territorial succession of Old Rus is to the Grand Duchy of, of Lithuania. Um, the legal succession, interestingly enough, is also to the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The Grand Duchy of Lithuania takes on the legal language and much of the legal practice of, of Kievan Rus. Moscow does not actually do that. Um, 
the leaders of Moscow are chosen not according to the succession principles, which were completely chaotic and basically not followed anyway, but according to who could raise the most money for, for the Mongols. So such, a, such, such um, succession principles as they were were violated. And not only in the 13th, in the 13th century and 14th century, but, but interestingly all the way through, I mean if you look at Russian history or Muscovite history that becomes Russian history, you have second sons being chosen and grandsons being chosen. You have a couple of females put on the throne by the guards in the 18th century. They don't actually get succession straightened out until the 19th century, which is rather interesting, because then you have the 20th century where there's no succession principle either in the, in the Soviet Union. But I'm saying all this to make a point, right? And here's the point. The point is that when Vladimir Putin in 2014 refers back to his Vladimir in 988 as a way to solve, resolve, or somehow push aside succession problems, in fact, he's doing something completely different, right? I mean, in fact, what he's doing is he's signaling what the basic problem of Russian political culture is, which is the lack of a succession principle, right? And you might say, okay, Snyder, that was an awful lot of East Slavic history just so you could, like, make this kind of psychoanalytic claim about President Putin displacing his concerns about succession onto the past. You could say that, but helpfully, in another speech, President Putin comes to my rescue and actually says exactly what I'm saying and says, yes, indeed, um, when I look closely at that history, I realize the succession was a problem after Yaroslav. And that makes me think, I'm quoting now, and that makes me think about today and tomorrow. Right? So this is not an anxiety that I'm imputing to him. This is an actual political problem. Okay. So if it's not solved by this kind of displacement, by this kind of, by this kind of reference, what are we to make of this reference? And, and here's the part where, where I want to try to get serious and actually consider what we should be doing with these kinds of historical references, what we should be doing with these kinds of, with these kinds of memories. Again, like the move that would be very easy to make, and if I were writing an op-ed, like I would end the op-ed here and say, like, look how silly the Russians are and how wrong they are about history, right? And then you could say, well, look how wrong the Americans are about history. And I'd say, you're right, we're all wrong, right? And then we'd be in that sort of relativist wonderland where we can all just accept that we're all wrong about everything, which admittedly is fun and will get you a PhD, but I'm going to try to be a little more serious. It will, well, it will in the 21st century. But I'm going to try to be a little more serious about this. What I want to try to do is suggest that this way of thinking about the past has a certain pattern, and that this pattern comes from somewhere, and it's interesting to ask where it comes from and what that means. In other words, this history of the kind that Vladimir Putin is suggesting means something beyond the factual claims. All right, so remember, if you want, about the amulets of Thor and the Hazars and so on. Um, what I'm trying to claim, though, is that it, there's a basic structure to the way Putin talks about history, and the structure is we did it ourselves. It was Slavs from the very beginning. It's continuous all the way through. There aren't any particular problems with our history, so don't ask. And if there are any problems, they came from the outside. Now, this particular notion of history, I mean, you can get it from a lot of places. You can get it from Pushkin, if you read Pushkin. You can get it from a lot of places in Russian culture. But I think it's pretty clear where Vladimir Putin actually gets it. He gets it from a Russian philosopher called Ivan Ilin. Now, again, just to short circuit the whole conversation about like how do I know that and am I just assuming that he reads books, the reason I think he gets it from Eileen is that he says so. Okay, so we can, we can talk later about like do presidents actually read books and what time of the week does, does the Kremlin reading group meet and so on. We can talk about that. But the reason why I think that it's Eileen is that in the speech where Putin talks about Crimea being our Jerusalem, I think he not incidentally cites Eileen. And there's, there, there's more. I mean, wait, there's more. You've probably been wondering, right, why in the 21st century not a single major forgotten 20th century intellectual has been recovered, rediscovered, right? I mean, tell me in Q&A if you can think of a single major forgotten 20th century intellectual who has been recovered in the 21st century. I think there's only one, and I'm still waiting to be, and I assume that the reason why we haven't recovered major intellectuals is because we're all, you know, we're busy texting, right? But there has been one. And there has been one, and that one is precisely Eileen, right? Um, Eileen's body, so here, here's my criteria for recovering an intellectual. First, you take the body from wherever it was buried and you bring it back home, you give it full military honors, um, you have the, the highest ranking priest of the of local religion, give it the highest religious honors. You find the archive wherever it is, someplace obscure like Lansing, Michigan, you have it brought back to your home country, Russia. You go to the grave, you lay flowers on a regular basis as the head of state. You have all the books published in very large editions, um, and then wherever possible and suitable, you cite this man, 
okay? So I can't prove, right? These things are always ultimately unprovable. I'm looking at Stephen Lukes and feeling very guilty about making any kind of claim about influence. Um, but you cannot prove influence, but, what you, but this is about as good as you can get, right? The reburial, the citation, the fl I find the flowers particularly touching, right? Think of it, I try to think of a president laying flowers on the grave of a philosopher, right? Like again, think of, I try to think of a second example of that. You've got the rest of this talk, right? Try to think of another example of that. Okay, now what is, so what is Eileen's scheme of history, right? What does Eileen say about, did you guys, did you think of one? Did you think of one? Okay. Um, the, what is Eileen's scheme of history? Eileen says, Russia is a bastion of innocence, right? Russia is innocent. Russia begins with a kind of virgin birth. So all of that nonsense I told you about the Scandinavians and the Hazars and so on, it's not true. It was the Slavs, it was the Slavs, the Slavs, the Slavs, and no one but the Slavs, they did it all themselves. Then Russia had, after the virgin birth, Russia had an immaculate empire. That is to say, Moscow was able to extend from being a village um, in the middle of Europe to being the largest state in the history of the world by a series of defensive battles. So Eileen goes through Russian history. It's, a, it's one of my favorite passages, and he categorizes every single battle that Moscow and then, the Russian, and then the Russian Empire was ever engaged in as defensive, which I think is sort of beautiful, right? It's beautiful to have history so coherent. So it's, there's a virgin birth, and then there's an immaculate empire, and there's no internal politics. Internal politics don't matter. Everything which happens inside Russia is a result of influence from the outside, in particular from Europe. So in, in Eileen's concept, um, Europeans fail to realize that A, Russia is entirely innocent always, no matter what, and B, that Russia always protects Europe from bad things, which may come from Pushkin. That's actually a powerful idea in Pushkin as well. And so as a result, all of Russian history, says Eileen, I'm quoting now, is a history of self-defense from Europe. He refers to Russian history also as a unending continental blockade um, and concludes that Russia can reckon 1,000 years of suffering. Now, what's telling about this, right? Okay, so it goes without saying that Aline was not a professional historian. I'm reading, he, 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 write, he wrote at length about everything. I mean, Aline was, he, Aline was a brilliant East European intellectual, but like many brilliant East European intellectuals, he was also a complete graphomaniac. So like once he sets his mind on a subject, he writes at great length about it, right? So for example, he has a whole book about courtesy, um, Lubiezhnost, which I found extremely useful because after I'd read the whole book, I realized I didn't have to respond to all of my emails. So it was a useful book for me, you know, because his, his conclusion is like, too much courtesy actually violates the principle of courtesy. I'm like, okay, I don't have to answer all my emails. This is very helpful. So if nothing else, I've gotten out of this Eileen project. Anyway, the, the point is that Eileen is not a historian, right? He writes, he wrote very long books about history and the ones that I've been citing to you, he actually wrote in German for the, for the Deutsche Bank of Baum. Um, but the, the reason he writes about history is another. The reason he writes about history has to do with a philosophical necessity. What Eileen says, and now we're getting a step closer to his philosophy where things are gonna get truly interesting. What Eileen says is that um, national history is, quote, pure and objective regardless of the contingent facts, okay? So it may not actually be true that all of Russia's battles were defensive and the virgin birth, like that may not be true in an empirical sense, right? But nevertheless, in some deeper non-contingent absolute sense, it is true, right? I mean, every Russian may not be innocent all the time, but in a deep sense, Russia as a collectivity is always innocent. And this is very important because this helps us to get to his philosophy. The key notion in his philosophy, and like now all the Hegelian, all the people who aren't Hegelians in the room can like take a quick nap. The key notion in his philosophy is what he calls the speculative concrete. And hopefully by the end of this talk, it'll be clear what is meant by the speculative concrete. Okay, I'll tell you right now, it means Russia. Russia is a speculative concrete. How do we get there? What's a speculative concrete? All right. Now, let, let, me, let me just now talk about Aline's philosophy. The reason I want to talk about Aline's philosophy is that, and if you follow all the steps, right, the step is there's a historical reference, we want to take the historical reference seriously, not because it's true, but because it leads us to a way of thinking, right? And then the question, okay, that's fine. I hope you'll go with me that far. What then is the way of thinking, right? And the way of thinking is incredibly interesting. Okay? So Eileen's major work of philosophy, which was published as his dissertation, he wrote his dissertation in 1916, and then republished it in 1948. And this is very convenient. I mean, for one thing, because he wrote it in Russian, um, and then, and then re rewrote it himself in German. And he did, this, he did this more than three decades later, right? So you can see, you can check the continuity of his views. 
His philosophy, as he states in the dissertation, goes like this. Um, the world, he says, um, and if you're not a Hegelian, you can still be napping at this point, but I, 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 hope, you're, I hope you're not, because this is a fantastically interesting v version of Hegelian thought. The world, he says, emerges as the process of the self-liberation of God. Okay, so this is fairly standard Hegelian stuff, right? The, what happens in history is that spirit, which Eileen says right away, spirit is God. Geist is God. Let's have no illusions. Geist is God, says Eileen. Spirit is emerging over history. God is emerging over history. And God is doing this as a, as a process of self-liberation, right? So God is perfect, but he can be even more perfect if he creates the world and then folds the world back into himself. This is the beginning of dialectical thought. Okay. Now, if this were to happen, says Eileen, if God created the world and then managed to enfold the world back into himself, we would then be in a perfect world. What does a perfect world look like for Eileen? Um, this, this is the most terrifying passage, or passages, chapters, I should say, of totalitarian prose, I think, that I have ever read. What it would mean would be, um, quote, divine totality. Okay? The empirical fragmentation of individual existence, writes Eileen, is an incorrect, a transitory, and a metaphysically untrue condition of the world. Were God to work himself out in history, writes Eileen, the empirical variety of human beings, that is the contingent fact that each of you has his or her own life, will be overcome. Right? Individuality will cease to exist, collectivity, organic unity will arise. But, this is where things get interesting, God failed. He failed. God was strong enough to create the world, um, but he was not strong enough then to bring the world back into himself at a higher level, right? There was a thesis, there was an antithesis, but there was no synthesis. God did his best, right? He was omnipotent in the sense that he could break his own rules and create something new outside of himself, but he was not omnipotent in the sense that having done that, he could bring that world back inside. He failed. He was too weak, right? Um, as soon as he created the contingent world, he, and this is where Eileen's prose gets very nice. He's actually a very beautiful writer, by the way. The State Department did an expose, not the State Department, what am I saying? The CIA. The CIA did an expose of Eileen. This is, this is awesome. They hired some poor graduate student to write about Eileen in 2007 or so, right? And one of the, and it's, so it's like this document, I'm happy to send you the PDF of this document. It's hilarious. And one of the things like the, like the snarky Americans say, they're like, oh, Eileen can't write, you know? He always uses more adjectives than he needs to. So it's totally not true. Eileen's a beautiful writer. He's a beautiful writer. He's a very good writer. Um, so, so, so when God creates the world, what happens, writes Eileen? He breathes the air of the irrational. I think that's very nice. He breathes the air of the irrational. Um, he finds himself a shepherd in the jungle. He's created this thing which he cannot master, right? And this thing is contingency, okay? This thing is contingency, empirical reality. All of his concepts, all of his ideas cannot bring... Humpty Dumpty can't be put back together again, basically. Once you create the empirical world with all of its unpredictability and its variety, you, God, with all of your concepts, all of your beautiful, clear concepts, you can't make it make sense again. You, you try and you fail. And interestingly, and there's a lot about this in Aline, then you suffer. So what has God been doing since he created the world? He's been suffering. He's been suffering endlessly, right, to Aline. Yet the unhappiness of the world is the unhappiness of its creator. Okay. Now, you might be asking, what does this have to do with politics? And it's going to get really political really quickly. Where exactly did God fail? What was the barrier to God? Who stopped God? Whose fault was it? Basically, you people, like people like you. It was, it was oh, that would work in America. You'll see what I mean in a second. People like you. The middle classes, says it means. Okay? God, God's power stops where the middle classes start. Because the middle classes are so wedded to empirical existence, right? Sensuousness, experience, right? The things you can get for money. The same, you know, the same critique of the middle classes that you can get from um, conservatives and Marxists, right? From everybody in the 19th century, right? I mean, who in the 19th century liked the middle classes, right? And certainly not their children, unfortunately. Um, so he has, he has this notion that the middle classes stopped God. And beyond that, he uses an interesting phrase, right? How did they stop God? with their civil society. They stop God with their civil society because civil society, he says, and he uses these words, by the way, he's writing in German or Russian, but he uses phrases that you would know. Um, civil society stops God with its inherent pluralism, right? The idea of civil society is that people form up groups based upon objectively different interests, which are irreconcilable, right? At the end of the day, you can't bring them down and say they're 
one thing. Civil society has different groups with different interests. And you might say, like if you're a boring liberal like me, you might say that's fine, right? But if you're a lean, you say that's what stops God. That's what stops God. Man stands here before his limit, writes Aline, which is also the limit of God in his earthly passage, which means that ideally the middle classes and civil society would be totally exterminated. Right? Um, unfortunately, God was not up to this task, and so we are where we are. Okay, now let's remember, where does, when is Aline finishing this doctoral dissertation? Um, which, um, 1916, okay? What happens in 1917. Um, what happens in 1917, um, the Russian Revolution, of course, <clears throat> helps him, actually confirms his view very strongly of the way the world works. In 1917, observing the revolution of 1917, Eline moves from being a kind of right-wing Hegelian, right? So, he, so Marx is a left-wing Hegelian. Eline is a right-wing Hegelian, about as far to the right as you can go while still being Hegelian, saying that God has tried and failed to exterminate the middle classes. That's about as far as you can go. Um, God is suffering. So the next move is a kind of right-wing Leninism. So what Eline says is that, okay, to be sure, God has not brought spirit into the world. God has not made the world rational. His concepts have not embraced the empirical chaos of experience. But happily, there is the light of the individual philosopher. The only rationality in the world is the rationality of the rational person in world history, which means himself, right? So just as Lenin or Leninists are making the claim that they can understand history well enough to push history forward, at exactly that moment, the moment of the Russian Revolution just after it, Elin is making the claim that philosophers like me can understand history well enough or the world well enough, truth well enough, to decide what is good and what is evil, okay? And what does the philosopher see? What does Eileen see? This is his second book, which, if anything, is more staggering than the first. Um, it's called uh, on, Resistance, on the Resistance of Evil by Force. Um, what the philosopher sees is evil. Okay? So since God, evil, by the way, is all the contingent things. It's the sensuous experience. It's every, it's every particular experience that you've had. It's every fact, everything, that you, everything which doesn't fit into a concept, which can't be united under God, that's evil. All right? just, so, that, just so you know that we're all, as far as I can tell, like thoroughly evil from this point of view. Um, so what the philosopher sees is evil. The empirical element, the, perma the permanent potency of evil, is therefore imminent in the world. Oh, and by the way, and in God, just in case you're wondering, and in God, okay. Evil is not, so he dismisses like, notions that we might think of. He says evil is not a logical possibility. It's not a subjective judgment. It's something true in the world. It's a spiritual tendency of, of man. And it's present because God failed, right? God could not overcome his own creation in the world. Therefore, evil is left in the world. Okay. Now, this is the part where um, lesser, lesser spirits, you know, might have stopped at the Gospels. Okay. So many Christians stop at the Gospels with their philosophizing. Not Eileen, right? So once you've taken the view that God failed and that God is weak and that God is suffering, once you've taken the original sin and you've taken it out of man and put it back into God's breast, which is basically what he does, you don't have any trouble saying that Jesus was also a failure and that, we've, and that Jesus needs to be understood in an entirely different way. So where it seems that, this is Eileen now, where it seems that Jesus says, um, uh, love thy enemy, what he means is, love thy personal enemy. But hate God's enemy, and I will tell you who God's enemy is. When Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged, he doesn't mean what he seems to be meaning. What he means is that every day is, in fact, judgment day, and God is judging you if you don't hate, destroy, and kill God's enemies. So he basically goes, rolls through the New Testament along these lines, dialectically reinterpreting most of Jesus' most famous statements to mean something which could seem very much like their opposite. And he concludes with a nice phrase, which appears both in a poem he wrote in 1928, I think, as well as in this book. May your sword be a prayer, and your prayer be a sword. Okay. So what follows from this is that since evil is imminent in the world, and since God is weak and off somewhere backstage suffering, right, God is unable to do any more good than he has already done, and evil is present in the world, um, this means that, Eileen again, the struggle against evil always requires heroism. You cannot count, and this is very important, you can't count on history because history has already happened and it's failed, right? Everything which has happened in history is evil and limited. 
um, there is no march forward to progress. There's not going to be more God. There's not going to be more of any good thing at all. This is it, right? His, you can't take anything from history. You have to act on your own. You have to act in some way from beyond history, okay? And so the politics are, what is evil? The Bolshevik Revolution is evil. The Bolshevik Revolution is an eruption of absolute evil upon, into the world. And therefore, what is absolute good? Or what is the action that man must take from beyond history? And if you're students of fascism, this should, always sound, this should already sound really familiar. You must come from beyond history. You must come from beyond rationality, from beyond good and evil. You must come from nowhere, right? And you must struggle and you must defeat the evil of Bolshevism. Fascism, says, says Eileen, is one of my favorite quotations from the man, a redemptive act of patriotic uh, arbitrariness, right? Of, of arbitrary, right? Arbitrizable, right? A redemptive act of patriotic arbitrariness. Okay. So the second book is a defense of Mussolini's coup d'etat. It is a very long, very sophisticated, very metaphysical Russian language defense of Mussolini's coup d'etat. And from here, his further political positions are going to be pretty much predictable and straightforward. He's going to defend Mussolini. He's going to defend Hitler. He's going to claim that fascism is the only hope um, for European civilization. And his main question is not, like, fasc is fascism good or bad? Fascism is wonderful, right? Fascism is the thing. Um, the question that troubles Aline is, why did fascism not come from Russia? That's the thing which troubles him, right? Um, and, and he spends a great deal of time coming up with a dialectical answer. And it goes like this. On the one hand, Russia is the ideal home for fascism, says Eileen. And now this should start to remind you of what he says about history, because Russia has a unique um, arrangement of the soul. Arrangement of the soul, Claude Duha. It has, Russia is heart, whereas the West is, is reason. In Russia, there is religion. In the West, there is philosophy. Um, the nation, the Russian nation, he says, is not God, but the strength of its soul is from God. Russia is an organic unity, right? And in Russia, the Ru Russian culture is a culture of fraternity, um, which means in practice there cannot logically be minorities in Russia because um, every, everyone is Im immediately brought in under the umbrella of Russian fraternal culture, and which follows that if you talk about a minority in Russia, for example, says Aline, if you use the word Ukraine or Ukrainian, um, what you are doing is you are revealing yourself to be an enemy, right? And it's as straightforward as that. If you say there's a minority, if you say there's a Ukrainian, that just means that you're a European who doesn't understand the goodness and the fraternal character of Russian culture, right? So you cannot divide Russia, says Aline, another very nice phrase. You cannot divide it. It's an organic unity. You can only dissect it, right? Because it's alive. It's alive. It's one, it's, one, it's one creature. Now, from this, you see how he gets the description of history. The description of history of being always unified, always innocent, all problems come from abroad, flows naturally from a philosophical necessity. The philosophical necessity is that Russia must be the ideal homeland for fascism. Why did fascism not arise first in Russia? Well, it, turned, this, it turns out Russia was too innocent. It was so innocent that it hadn't developed Eileen's term, an immune system that could resist Eileen's term, the microbes of Western culture, right? And so therefore, Bolshevism, communism, Marxism came from the West and infected Russia because Russia was too innocent, right? Russia's too innocent. But you get the basic point, right? The basic point is that in its essence, in its non-empirical, you know, invisible essence, Russia is the perfect homeland for fascism. It's organic, it's united, it's divine, right? And it's only outsiders, Europeans, right, with their contingency, their empirical, their insistence on empirical reality, um, their sensuality, their decadence. It's only they um, who, who have prevented Russia from being what it should be. Okay, now what does this mean for policy? So let me say a couple things about policy and a word of conclusion, I'll be done. What does this mean about policy? The, the first thing this means um, for policy is, well, let me, first of all, let me just, Russia is the speculative concrete. Okay, I just wanted to say that. Russia is the speculative concrete. Um, what, 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 what Elin does in the first part of his book about Hegel, which I recommend to you because it's fantastic, um, it, the first part of his book, he rearranges what we mean by, by general, so abstract usually goes with general, 
right? Ab you would think abstract means the very general. Um, all the philosophers are not going to get very upset with me, but abstract usually means very general. It's like the extreme of general. And concrete is the extreme of particular, right? So we associate the concrete with the particular and the general with the abstract. Okay, Luke's is nodding. That's good. Um, what Eileen spends the first part of his dissertation doing is saying, no, actually the concrete, the concrete is the general. The concrete is the general. He, and he calls this the speculative concrete. And what he means is that there can be something which is particular, the Russian soul, which is also very big, Russia. Okay? So, so what, what philosophy is all about is the speculative concrete, which is Russia. Okay, I just wanted to get that point across. You, you can forget it now. So the point is that Russia potentially is a land of totality without contingency, right? Without contingency, without empirical reality, all an organic unit. Okay. What does that mean for policy? You might be thinking, how could you have policy recommendations from this? Of course you have policy recommendations. The first is, how do you choose a leader of Russia? Okay. Now remember where we started. We started with the problem of a lack of succession in Russia, a lack of succession principle. In this worldview, that's not a problem. I mean, it's succession, succession principles, these are all things that you're concerned about if you were living in empirical reality, right? Or if you're concerned with history. What Eileen says, and this is not crazy, I mean, this has, this has a certain logic. What Eileen says is that the agent of change for Russia must come from without, outside of history, from outside of history. Because history, remember, is spoiled, right? God tr history is God's failure to turn the world into totality. History is spoiled. So the Marxists are wrong, the liberals are wrong, that you can, imagine, you can expect anything good from history. History is History has nothing to offer. If you're going to save Russia, and save is the word he always uses, right? Everything is spasitelny, spas, right? Over and over again, we're talking about redemption, salvation. If you're going to save Russia, you must be a figure who comes from outside of history. A, writes Eileen, living organ of Russia, the instrument of her self-redemption, right? We will accept our freedom and our law from the Russian patriot who leads Russia to salvation, right? Spas, spasitelny, spas, spasitelny. So um, what follows from this, then, is that there will be some moment right, where some special person will arrive from off scene, right, perhaps a former KGB officer, or, you know, who knows, so, so will arrive from backstage and become the leader of Russia, right, for no apparent reason. Um, and he doesn't need a successor because the, because the next person is going to arrive also from off stage. So this solves the succession problem. Okay. What does this mean for foreign policy? And those of you who have read Carl Schmitt will not be surprised at Eileen's definition of politics, which is, quote, the art of identifying and neutralizing the enemy, which makes perfect sense, right? If you are an organic whole and you're innocent um, and you're a leader from outside history, you need to protect your country from history. Eileen says this leader should be, and he has a whole book about constitutional order, which is fascinating. He says the leader should be a quote unquote national dictator who is in charge of the military, the judiciary, the executive, and the parliament. Um, he, he's writing all this after the Second World War, Right? So the stuff I'm talking about now, the constitutional stuff, is after the Second World War. So there's this idea, which I think is generally pretty questionable, that Europeans learn from the Second World War. Um, Eileen, at least, is a very good instance of someone who didn't change his views at all as a result of the Second World War. He is still just as much of a fascist after as he was before. Um, what, he, what he says is that the mistake that the totalitarians made was to have a one-party state. That was a mistake. We should have a zero-party state right? um, instead. Uh, and elections should serve the purpose of ritually renewing the people's faith in the... Any of this starting to sound familiar? Elections should serve the purpose of ritually renewing the people's faith in the leader. The election should be public, right? So either we should... He writes about all this. We should stand and raise our hands in public, like Hungarian peasants did in the 1920s, or there should be transparent ballot boxes, and you should sign the ballots, right? Again, I mean, any resemblance to empirical reality is purely accidental, I'm sure. Um, and, the, and, and the basic idea is that all of society should be covered by a corporatist pyramid, which if you remember like interwar Austria or interwar Italy, this, the idea of corporatism is that everything which you might think of if you're a liberal as civil society is under the state. The state is there's a kind of pyramid, a kind of divinely arranged order with the state at the top. And of course, in Eileen's version, the middle class, there's no civil society, right? There's no organization which is not part of the state. And the middle classes are at the very bottom. There's a leader, um, there are the peasants, the middle classes are at the very bottom. And this is also, by the way, um, a solution to the problem of foreign policy, okay? Because if this is your idea of domestic policy, right? And this is your idea of the way the world works, 
then Europe is obviously the enemy, right? The European Union with its promotion of civil society and human rights, its middle classes and so on, this is fairly obviously the enemy. And I can't go into the details, but you can see how this, I think, you can see how these concepts work, them, work themselves out pretty well after 2011. Okay, two words, two words of conclusion. The first is that um, this, I mean, taking Eileen seriously, as I've tried to do, I mean, admittedly, like, I've made some jokes, like, here and there, but I, he is an extremely interesting philosopher, um, one of the great Russian thinkers of the 20th century, and definitely worth reading. Um, I mean, he's a wonderful writer, he's a wonderful stylist, he's a very clear thinker, um, and so in addition to the fact that it's just terrifying, right, it's also, it's also rather beautiful and elegant, and you find yourself being convinced at certain points. Like, I, like I, I, would, I would take my head up at certain points and like, okay, now I have to stop thinking about the world as an organic reality which God has failed to create because I took my kids from school, and that's an empirical reality which is impinging upon that search for organic unity. Okay. Anyway, what does this do for us? It helps us to understand Eurasianism. Eurasianism is something that you hear a lot, but it's not easy to say what Eurasianism is. I'm going to try to now say what Eurasianism is. And believe me, what I'm going to say is going to be a lot more straightforward than if you actually had Sorkol or Dugan telling you what it is. What is Eurasianism? Eurasianism is the resolution of an old problem in how to characterize Russian history. On the one side, in the 19th century Russia, right? Russians looking at the West. What do you do with the West? There's that one position, and this is the part where my Russianist colleagues leave the room, sorry. On the one side, you have the Westernizers, and they say Russian history is like European history. Same principles, same progress, we're just a couple steps behind. And then you have the Slavophiles, who say our history is not like Western history. We are inherently, we're an irreducibly different culture, and it's going to follow a different pattern. We have our own way of development. Okay? Eurasianism is the solution to that problem. What Eurasianism says is the West is not inherently democratic, pluralistic, and liberal. That is an artificial incrustation on the surface, right, which is brought by Jews. I mean, Eileen's very tactful about how he talks about that, unlike some people who follow him, but that's the basic idea. Some unfortunate minorities have, have, have created a West which is artificial, right? If you get rid of them, the West will naturally go fascist. It will, go, it will flop back to its natural state. And that solves the problem, right? So what, the move that Eileen makes is to say, the West is actually not different from Russia. We're all, we should all basically be following God's will and go fascist. Um, and if you strip away the artificial, superficial, superstructural part of Western history, you will see that, right? And so there's, there, we're not two different paths of history. There's no path of history. We're all together on the total lack, the total lack of a path of history. And Lean, by the way, personally exemplifies this unity very nicely. It would take an entire other talk to tell you why I think it's so important and interesting that he had a German mother, right? Um, his German is suspiciously good for a reason, which is that it was his mother tongue. Um, and while we're talking about the things that you won't read on the Russian Wikipedia page, um, when he went to Vienna to, and missed the First World War, it was to undergo psychotherapy along with his um, lover, uh, which of course was carried out in German, right? All of his philosophical influences are German. This whole talk has been about Hegelian, right? Um, his mo the, the person who taught him how to read Hegel, and again, this would be another whole talk to go into, is Husserl. He spent the summer of 1911 with Husserl, right? So his influences are Husserl, Freud, Hegel. Um, he spends his adult life from the age of 39 till his death in Germany and then in Switzerland. He writes a lot more in German than he does in Russian. He, he get, almost all of his lectures are given in German. So as a human being, he embodies this, this Eurasianism, right? He shows that Russia and the West can be brought together in a certain way, not by Russia accepting the false principles of the West, but by the West informing Russia as Russia moves towards its true path, which is fascism. Okay, that's, that's the first point. The second point, and then I really, really will be done, um, is, is I think that all of this helps us to understand something. I think it's not enough to say that Russian foreign policy makes sense. I mean, I've been saying how it makes sense for a long time. It, there is a certain strategy. The strategy is to bring the European Union down, to bring everybody down to the same level. That has a strategic sense. But if you want to ask why that's working, or to put the question more sharply, why do so many people like that, right? Because normally, like, when there's a model, you like the model because it's better than your own country. 
But there really aren't that many Austrians or, you know, for that matter, Americans, since we have Trump, who's like a phenomenon all to himself. Um, but in his connections with this whole tradition are very interesting. Um, we, it's, Americans or Germans or Austrians or, you know, full national voters in France, it's not that they look at Russia and say that's a better country than ours. But nevertheless, somehow the Russian model is attractive, or at least influential, right? So there's a puzzle here, because usually you think something is better, like a model is usually better, right? And in this case, it's not, and yet it's working. And I think the only way to understand that is to understand that the people who are pushing this model in some sense believe in it, right? That it's not just a strategy, that there's, not, there's a worldview here. There's a set of beliefs which, are, which, which people actually take to be true. I think even someone who is, like, is deeply, you know, bottomlessly cynical, as Surkov thinks he is, I think there is actually a level of belief and faith in all of this, um, even if it's a faith in darkness, which is the very last thing that, that, that I want to say. Um, let me try to return to, to history, right? So I said the ancient is the modern, or the modern is the ancient. In, in the way this is all working, the modern summons the ancient, right? The modern summons, the, we stand in the present and we summon the ancient. But we're not summoning the facts. On the contrary, we're summoning the ancient because summoning the ancient helps us provide a picture of history which is perfectly coherent, right? And therefore perfectly attractive. It gives us a picture of the past in which we, in this case Russia, but it can be others, and in, in which we are totally innocent. And that, in Eileen, and I think in many of Eileen's followers, that, that is precisely the, 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 act of, the act of faith. When you work to dissolve something like a European Union or republics or the rule of law, I think you're doing it not just strategically, I think you're doing it because in some sense you believe that underneath all of this there is going to be at least one organic whole, um, and that thing is going to be Russia. In other words, and this is really the last thing I'm going to say, we're confronting an end of history, but in a very different way than Francis Fukuyama had in mind, right? So Francis Fukuyama was, you know, he was, he was like the popcorn-eating, optimistic Hegel follower, right? We're going to watch history play itself on a screen, you know, eat some popcorn, and everything's going to turn out really wonderfully because in the, in the Hollywood happy end, there's just going to be one idea, right? Um, there's going to be one idea that he, is, that he is liberal democracy. And he gets that by way of Kozhev from Hegel. That's, that's where he's getting this. Now, um, here, we're, here we're confronted with another Hegelian. And this other Hegelian has a very different message. His message is not that there's one universal idea, right? His message is that there is one particular faith, one particular faith, the faith that if you can just strip away all the things that you see, all the things that you experience, you have a nation which is actually perfect and true and innocent, a particular faith, a speculative concrete. And of course, that speculative concrete is the essence of the thing which we call fascism. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take my I'll take my questions. If you could just if you could um, tell me your tell me your name because I don't know all of you. Um, and when when I'm in a, when I'm in America, I always say like um, you know I always say like ask your question in the form of a question, right? Not like they do in Europe, and everybody laughs. So you you can show me how that's not a joke. And, you know. Okay, only, I only got the Americans on that one. That was a wonderful wonderful talk. I'm just reeling. I have one very primitive question, which is, why Russia? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you strip away everything, and you're left with one perfect country, and he says it's Russia. But why Russia? What if someone else says, I strip away everything, and it turns out it's the Congo, or it's Peru? Mm -hmm. um, does he, would he have an answer? I mean, what is the content of Russia that he finds, once you get rid of everything that's not good about it, is so great? Mm -hmm. So. Let me, I, I should stand in the same place and not move. Okay, sorry. Um, I'll only move my upper body. How about that? Okay. Um, let me answer that at two different levels. Like, lo logically, there's no problem with that, right? And this is the difference between, I mean, as you know, it's the difference between most of the fascists and the national socialists, right? The, fa the fascists, um, you know, it, although they were trying to, they tried to get along with the Nazis and were sometimes supported by the Nazis. Many of your authentic, you know, old style 1920s, 1930s fascists had a problem with the German Nazis because the German Nazi, in a Nazi perspective, there really can only be one, right? If it's about blood, 
um, and about some kind of biological superiority. And there's, there's, a, there's a hierarchy. The Germans really are on top. And the Germans, you know, the Nazis treated other fascists that way, too. It, they didn't look at Ukrainian fascists and say, oh, you're a fascist, therefore we're in some sense equal. They looked at Ukrainian fascists and they saw Untermenschen, right? But with the fascists, it was a little bit different. I mean, you, you can actually talk about a kind of fascist pluralism where Italian fascists and Romanian fascists and Ukrainian fascists recognized each other um, in the conversations in the 20s and 30s. So Ilin, when he looks at Italian fascists and German fascists, he thinks their fascism isn't going to be as good as our fascism, right? I mean, he, and, and, but I think he would also be capable of a relativist move of saying, but of course, they would think the same thing about my fascism, right? So it's perfectly legitimate for there to be, you know, this kind of view about the Congo or Italy or Sardinia or Montreal. There's no logical problem with that. Empirically, why do you think Russia is so wonderful? I mean, here there's no empirical reason whatsoever why he thinks Russia is so wonderful. People, many people in this audience will have recognized an extreme case of you know, how the Russian intelligentsia romanticizes the people, you know, and then you go into, then you go abroad and you romanticize them even more. This is the kind of apotheosis, right, of the romanticization of the people. If you read Eileen's correspondence from when he was actually in Russia, I mean, admittedly he had no contact with the people even then. I mean, he was, he was from a noble family. He went to law school like they all did. Um, but when he writes about the Russian peasantry, he doesn't, you know, he says, like, they're backward, they're horrible, they don't wash, you know. He says this, he does the same thing, basically, that every Petersburg intellectual or Moscow intellectual would do. He, he says, like, you know, in, in pra they don't really understand God, they don't understand anything. So he, there's no particular reason, you know. There's, it's, a logical, it's a logical necessity. We, and to, to, to figure out why he would have to think this, you have to, you have to give some kind of psychological answer, which I can't really do. But, you know, he's not alone, right? He's not, there's, a whole, there's a whole movement in the 30s where people make this kind of move. This, this, Stephen had a question, too. Just a second. Yeah. Thank you very much for the brilliant lecture. Uh, I'd like, what do you think about the reason of uh, Russian mythology choice of uh, national hist um, uh, national heroes from Alexander Nevsky and uh, Ivan Foss to uh, Stalin, etc. Et What's the reason of this choice of national heroes in Russian historian mythology? So, who's, so can you be like whose choice? What choice of Russian mythology yeah. of more important figures yeah. in Russian history, uh, in Russian historian mythology. So let me, I'm just going to give you a, so I mean following the, both Russian policy and opinion polls, you know, show different sets of heroes at, at different times and Stalin has been climbing lately, as you, as you know. But so I'm going to, let me make a more general point about, about heroes, which is I think useful for Ukraine as, as well. A hero, a hero is a figure not from the contingent world of history that we study, right? A hero is a figure from the non-contingent metaphysical organic world of myth, right? And so when governments, whether it's a Russian government or Ukrainian government, um, name someone a hero, I mean, one response can be like, I don't like that person in particular, right? Um, so, you know, when I, object, like, when I objected to Shukhevich being named a national hero in Ukraine, I, there were two reasons. One is, I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. But then there's another form of objection, which is naming anyone a hero. Is, is taking a kind of metaphysical step. It's like moving away from history into, into myth and legend, and that makes me uncomfortable in, in, in general. Great. Uh, thanks for that lecture, Tim. Um, and another uh, figure from the past century who was brought back physically with a certain legacy is Anton Denikin, yeah. who has also been quoted. He's not a philosopher, I wouldn't say that, yeah. but he... Uh, um, had certain ideas about Russian Empire and Ukraine and, and Putin, when he brought him back with the abbot of Daniel of Monastery, uh, said the world should read what mm -hmm. Danikin wrote about Russia and Ukraine. And I'm wondering if you know if Ilin wrote about Danikin or yeah. saw Danikin as part of what he thought was good, if Putin connects the two of them in any way, and would you call Danikin proto-fascist? Okay. I'm going to answer some of those, but not all of them. Um, the, 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 the two of them were brought back together. And, uh, and, and, and Putin gave speeches about both of them at the same, at the same time. So it's certainly connected. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, you know, hang, I'm going to stand by my claim that that's not 
a revival philosopher, right? I mean, whatever we might say about Denikin, as a battlefield strategist, the man is not a philosopher. So I'm still waiting for someone to correct my claim that there is no forgotten 20th century intellectual who has been revived in the 21st, except for Eileen, right? I find that, I, just, I hope that's not true because it's just so dark if it is. Um, the second question that I will answer is that yes, Eileen wrote about Denikin at the time, right? So he wrote, he wrote about, he wrote, I didn't use the word because it's kind of confusing, but he wrote about the white movement. And his idea, you know, he was very quick among what had been the liberal intelligentsia to switch over to the whites um, and very quick to try to become one of their ideologists. And his idea was that there was a white movement and this white movement um, he sees as a kind of proto-fascism. Um, so not, not me now, I'm not saying this, it's a proto-fascism. It's a sign that Russia should have been the first fascist country. And it's the artificial you know, Western power of Bolshevism which prevents this from happening. I wouldn't say that these guys were fascists, no. I would say that they were you know, right-wing, they, they were reactionary, um, but I, they don't have that. They don't, they don't have the sort of views on history that would qualify, or like the, they don't or, try to organize political movements of that kind. So no, I wouldn't say they were fascists. But Eileen saw them as like the, the, the sign that Russia was going in the right direction. That was fascinating. I have to say, I, I've never read a word of Eileen, and you're convincing me that I should, I think. But what I want to know is something about, oh, about, about the way in which he was a fascist thinker. I mean, if you think about the other, some of the other major inspirers of fascism, and fascist, fascism understood very generally, they've had very penetrating things to say about about democracy, about civil society, that in the way of criticizing, in fact, getting under the skin of liberals and Democrats. I mean, I'm thinking in particular of the way in which Isaiah Berlin wrote about Demest, wrote about Sorel, wrote about um, other great thinkers of the extreme right, um, but was fascinated by them just because they were unsettling, unsettling to True. liberals and Democrats uh, who, who, who should read them because they say things that are disturbing and true. Mm -hmm. Now, is that true about Eileen? I think that's a really interesting question. I, I, I found him just, I mean, everyone's subjective experience would be different. I, I, found, I found him disturbing for a different reason, which is that you get, you get sort of swept away, right? So I, I, would, I, would, I would read Eileen for a while, and then I would talk to my, you know, my, as it were, normal, like, hedonist, you know, empiricist, ethicist, Western philosopher types, you know, just to kind of remind myself of what Eileen was calling evil. <laughs> um, and uh, it, so, no, I mean, the experience is more, that it's, like, it's a little bit more like reading Nietzsche almost. He's a, good, he's a good writer, and you get carried away by the turns of phrase a little bit. The critique of the West is not as good um, as you would find in people who had a deeper experience of Republican life or pluralist life. Uh, Eileen grew up in the Russian Empire, it, his, the original way he's, the original problem he sets for himself is the same problem which his generation set for himself. All these people who went to law school and were in fact philosophers, the original the problem is the Kantian one of how you get legal consciousness to appear empirically in this backward Russian nation. So there's the law and there's the nation, and how you get those two somehow to come together. That's where he's coming from. And it's a, it's a question that you can't really answer institutionally because you don't have the architecture of institutions to play around with in the Russian Empire that you might in, say, France at the same time. So he doesn't have that kind of experience with democracy and its weaknesses, or a republic and its weaknesses. That's not where he's coming from. You know, and then he comes to Germany and Weimar, you know, and, and Weimar is what he sees, and it collapses very soon, and he says, good riddance. So he, he, is, more on the, he is more of the type of... Um, of course, God could never let this happen for long. You know, he, he's, the, the contradictions he sees are very fundamental rather than institutional. His critique is, the, is only, his critique doesn't, it, it, another interesting thing is his critique instantaneously, or always already, refers to something outside the system. So the problem with civil society, and this will be a familiar refrain, the problem with civil society is not just that it fragments. The problem with civil society is that any instance of civil society, insofar as it's not totally contained by the organic national whole, must be linked to something beyond the nation. It logically must be, and therefore it's treacherous, right? And any, so I, I said zero party system, but he was completely sincere. He, one party was too much, and the problem is that 
if you, any political party by its nature, it doesn't just fragment, but it will have links to the outside world. So his critique of institutions is almost, it's like, it's like it is Hegelian, like you, you're looking at particular and immediately you're looking at the whole right away. And he, he, every, his arguments always have that form. You look at some small thing and immediately you're looking at the whole rather than the kind of step-by-step -step analysis of how, these, of how these things work. So he's not, he's not so persuasive on, the, on, on that score. I don't think, he, yeah, he's not troubling in that way, yeah. Um, I would be interested, uh, does Ilin um, is, uh, um, address the issue of Russia um, as an empire, or to put it in other words, um, what is, you mentioned the organic uh, nation uh, as a whole, um, is, it, is he focused on Russia as um, Russian-speaking Christians um, be believing in, in Russian orthodoxy, or what is the... Yeah, see so these are the kinds of things that as soon as you say them, I'm just, I'm just going to sort of try to perform, Eileen, because you can't really answer the question in the terms that you've set them. Within his system, as soon as you say those things, you're making the kind of empirical characterizations which reveal that you don't understand Russia, right? That's, that's what he says, it's what he has to say, right? He's not interested, and this is a, you know, his very sympathetic Russian biographer, there's, um, there's a, a guy at Kansas wrote a you know, very nice dissertation about Eileen. Um, very sympathetic, very sympathetic dissertation about Eileen. But it, one of the things he says in the conclusion, and quite rightly, is that Eileen just can't handle the problem of political variety. He can't, you know, he, he wishes, it'd be, you know, if you want to be mean, you just say, he wishes it away, right? He, from his point of view, Russia is the, Russia really is, you know, not the empirical population count with the different faiths and even, you know, the Muslims, right, which don't even appear, like they just, they simply do not appear. The Ukrainians appear, but with, they're decorated by quotation marks, right, because what a Ukrainian is, is a signifier that someone in the West is lying about Russia, right, that's what, that's what the word Ukrainian means, it means someone in the West is lying about, someone in the West is attacking Russia, or at the, in the best case, someone in the West doesn't understand. Russia. So he's, yeah, so he, he, what he says, he's accept, he accepts that Russia is an empire, to answer the very first part of your question. But once you're inside the borders of Russia, it's all this kind of magical, mystical stuff where everything folds into the, the deep organic hole. And if you look too closely at it, you're, 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 you're an enemy. Um, there's another interesting thing you have to say about empires, though. And it has to do with, with what the contemporary Eurasianists have done and what, and what Russian foreign policy has done. Because there's a, there's a slippage here between Bolshevism and the European Union. Right? So the European Union is now being presented you know, in different ways by different people. You know, Dugin says it one way, Glazyov says it a different way. Um, the, the European Union is now being presented as, this cor as the corrosive agent of contingency, you know, which enlivens our civil society and creates this horrible pluralism and so on. It's, it, it is now like the instantiation of what the evil West always does to Russia. You can ask whether Eileen would have seen it that way, right? When Eileen was finishing, when he dies in 1954, he looks at Europe and says, you Europeans shouldn't criticize us because you're all still empires, right? That's his, you know, that's his move. Europe is still a Europe of, and he's not wrong. In 1954, that's entirely, you know, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to say. And what Eileen says is, you know, you're all empires, and Franco and Salazar show the way of the future. Franco and Salazar are going to bring about a corrected European fascism, and so in the future there's going to be a kind of fascist commonwealth in which Russia is going to be a part. So you could ask what Eileen would have actually thought if he had seen the European empires collapse, and whether he really would have seen the European Union, you know, as the, as the same kind of threat from the West as, as other things. You know, I don't know. But in, 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 as a matter of fact, I mean, it's one of these things where you can just say their interpretation isn't the only one, but it's a perfectly reasonable one. Um, you said that um, Putin referred to Ilin, and um, I would be interested, do you really think that he um, sort of is such an intellectual that he really... Uh, bothered to uh, read his books, or was there just any spin doctor in the 
behind Putin and said, well, that would fit at the moment and just take Eileen and use, use him for political reasons. Now, see, this is like, and this is like when I said earlier, like this, this is the inevitable question. And of course, you know, every intellectual historian will say you can't prove influence and influence is very complicated. But I mean, I would start from the end of your question and say that I'm confident that it's not something so simple as, as that. Because um, at the level of the ideas, it's not like Stalin's version of Leninism, right? It's not, there isn't a short course in Eileen where you can just kind of like apply whatever happens. In order to, in order to quote Eileen, you actually have to think a little bit. Um, you have to, and, and it's, it does look like he is thinking a little bit. But the second thing is, if you're just going to use the guy, I mean, why equate him with Denikin? Why bring the body back, right? Which is a very symbolic thing to do, in part because, I mean, to make another point that you won't read on the Russian Wikipedia page, um, Eileen was buried. The tomb. Eileen was buried by the wife of an American millionaire, who actually supported him for the last 16 years of his life, subsidized his publications, paid for his lectures, paid his rent, paid for his burial, paid for his wife's burial, put up the tombstone. You know, so bringing him back is, you know, is from Switzerland, which is where he died. Bringing him back from Switzerland is in a way undoing all of that. But it's not. You don't. You know, it's not something people do casually. There aren't that many reinterments. It doesn't happen all that often. And you know, going to the cemetery and laying flowers, I think it's also something that's not done casually. Um, and the citation, you know, it, he seems to cite Eileen at critical points. Like in 2011, December 2011, you know, the, the, when the last mass Russian protest movement against the falsified parliamentary elections, he cites Eileen. He invades Ukraine, he cites Eileen. He says Crimea is our Jerusalem, he cites Eileen. He seems to do it at points where something very so something is turning, something, something's, very, something's very important. And I mean, I guess another way to think about it would be, why bother? Like, if it's just superficial, like, he's not, who ca you know, no one knows who Aline is, so like, outside of Russia, so what different, why bother, you know, going, citing Aline? Why not cite somebody, why not cite somebody Russians knew about before, who knows? So I, I, I can't prove it, but I have to say, I find myself very strongly, my intuitions are very strongly against the, it's just a spin doctor, or it's just calculating, or it's just cynical. I think, I think this thinker has allowed them to make sense of the world that they're trying to move around. I, I think it's helped them to make sense of their own predicament and what they're, and what they're doing with that predicament. But you know, I can't, you can't prove it in the way that you can prove other things. Hmm. And I mean, you know, so the most important spin doctor is Surkov, right? And I think, you know, and this comes from reading him and his novels, and I, I think that even the deepest, darkest spin, do like sometimes precisely it's the deepest, darkest, you know, apparently most cynical spin doctor who somewhere down at the bottom has the most naive article of faith, right? And that's what Eline is. I mean, Eline is an unbelievably intelligent and sophisticated man. If you're sort of, there's no shame in having his portrait on your wall. He's a very, very smart man, but at the bottom of it, there's an unbelievably naive article of faith, right? And I think, you know, there might be something in that. Thank you so much for a very interesting, really thought-provoking uh, presentation. I want to, to dwell on the previous question because, uh, after all, we are not discussing Eileen here. You started from uh, the task to, to describe the standpoint or the chronotope of contemporary Russia. Yeah, the world, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, but precisely yeah. Russia. Yeah. And how do you connect Ilyin concept and the standpoint of contemporary Russia? Because uh, we can stick to this sort of, you know, person-oriented story that uh, Putin got inspired with these ideas and tries to implement them, mm -hmm. which sounds a bit of speculative. Or we can think that Ilyin was genius and, and he captured this special spirit of Russian, I don't know, uh, geist or whatever. So kind of Russian people, what, what they can do in this world. Or, or do you perceive it as a viable strategy for Russia in the contemporary world? So basically, what is the connection and how can you explain the influence of right. Ilyin and what does it give us? Yeah, yeah. To so, understand Russia. I mean, let me, let me just let me say three things in response. Okay, the first is that 
it's also a speculation to say that he doesn't matter, right? You're never safe from speculation, right? If you hear the lecture and you say, I don't think he matters, I would say that's, you know, that's also speculation. And in these, in these matters, we're always going to be weighing like a little bit of evidence one way or the other. I think 100 years from now, you know, if history is still being practiced, this will probably be a little bit clearer than it is right now. Right? For example, there is a Kremlin reading group, but I don't know when they meet. You know, I don't know everything that they've read. I, have, I know some. I don't know everything. 100 years from now, somebody will know. Right? Um, but I would just say you can't escape speculation. There's no safe place to go where you're not speculating. If you, just, like, if you question the association I'm making, you're, 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 just, you're, you're doing a counter speculation. Okay, I'll stop being Hegel for a second. Um, second point is that um, I'm not, so just to kind of simplify the question a little bit, I'm not going to go into like what the contemporary Russian chronotope is. You know, I don't know. You know, I just, I, I don't know, right? That, you'd, have to, you'd have to have a lot more data. I'm just trying to th get, I'm trying to get at the mindset of a few people um, who have made a turn in policy, which I think cannot easily be explained by, by contemporary, that's my timer, I think, sorry. That's like, if I'd talked that long, it would have been really long. <laughs> that's, that's, what that, that's what that meant. Um, <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. Um, no, I mean, that would be great. Um, that, so it, it's an attempt to, I mean, it's, it's an attempt to, to say that something is only half rational. So you know, remember how I began with, with like this idea that you can look at, you can, I mean, it goes back to your question too. You can look at this and you can say, well, it's just a kind of cynical covering. It's just a kind of packaging for stuff that they wanted to do anyway for other reasons. That's basically what all the Americans say. Like you give this talk in front of Americans and like Amer every American will say, oh, it's just pragmatic, you know, it's just like chewing gum, right? And that makes me think it's wrong because Americans are always wrong about everything when it comes to Russia. Th th that, that move that like it's just like some kind of compensation or just filling in the gaps, I'm, I'm, I'm very suspicious about that. And the reasons I'm suspicious are I think they're pursuing these policies with conviction. I don't think they're pursuing them just strategically. And I think they're pursuing policies which don't make sense. From the, if, if you were the kind of person who thought only about um, the spin doctoring, um, if you're the kind of person who thought only about messaging, you would not be pursuing policies which are so catastrophic for your own country. But that's the other thing which I think has to be explained. Right? How is it that Russia is doing things to, to the West with conviction, but also to itself with conviction, which are really hard to explain without some kind of other ideology. And it might be a different ideology than what I'm talking about, but this is sort of my best, my, my best guess. Um, so let's see, was there, there's another part of your question which I'm overlooking. OK, OK, well. I mean, no, with the chronotope, it goes for, I mean, so like the stuff I said at the beginning, and this goes back to, like, in a way, the why Russia question. I don't think this is just Russia. I mean, part of the, I think Russia is, I'm not a Westerner who looks at Russia and say, says, like, Russia is something exotic and different, and let's, like, like put it under the, you know, the microscope. I look at this, and I see the history of the West in a certain form, right? I look at this, and I see tendencies which are also present in the United States and in, and in other and in other places. Uh, so the chronotope, like the collapse of the future and then, and then the, attendant, the attendant condensation of the past, I think that's happening everywhere. You know, again, it's like that's way beyond what I can prove, but I think that's happening everywhere, and I think in Russia it's just taking on a particularly pure form. Yeah, may I have a question oh. out of a position of sheer ignorance on Eileen, and which is, if the question, if I understood you rightly, which he tries to answer is, why is it that fascism does not originate in Russia? Um, what does he think is the place of Russia in a landscape of different fascisms? Um, because when you were talking about his idea of what the concrete and the particular is, you were describing um, the kinds of arguments which we hear from fascists in Italy as much yeah. as in India. Yeah. So this sounds very, very familiar to me. Yeah. However, the Indian uh, right wing will not make an argument for it being somewhere how special uh, in the world history of fascism. And therefore, I'd be just quite interested in sort of finding out what does he think, um, you know, having not given birth to the idea, what should it now be doing? 
Yeah, that's so interesting because in a way I wonder if he isn't giving himself away as a European by these claims that like we're first, right? Because Europeans always have to be first with everything, you know, like, yeah, well, it, so I think because what he's, he is very invested in the idea that fascism is an outgrowth of what he calls the white movement. <clears throat> You know, and empirically, there are some points to be made there. There were some Russians who brought some important texts to the West, and there were some influential Baltic Germans and so on. But he's invested in the claim that the, the white movement chronologically comes before fascism, and fascism is, like, is, is one thing which arises out of the white movement. So he refers, to our, he refers to my fascist brothers, right? But he doesn't exclude the possibility that the white movement would take on a form and a name which was different than fascism also. But fascism is this thing which arose out of this broader thing which he calls the white, the white movement. Um, so he is, I mean, he, one, I guess one thing which sheds some light on this is his fascination with Mussolini. So he, in, the, um, in, in, a, in, a, in a Russian language French immigre newspaper called Rebirth, he writes a whole series of pseudonymous articles about how wonderful Mussolini is, um, and which, which flesh out a little bit these notions of someone coming from outside of, of history. So the fact that he's so capable of admiring a foreigner Right? Like, so Russia should have been first, but we were nevertheless capable of admiring Mussolini. And then he's also, at the beginning at least, he's very capable of admiring Hitler as well. So he, you know, Hitler's, got it, Hitler's got it right about the Bolsheviks being Jews and the Jews being Bolsheviks. You know, Hitler is right to, 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 to push them away from the center of power as, as Aline sees it. So he's capable of admiring these other movements that he sees as kindred. Um, so I think like the claim that we're first is, you know, it's a kind of, it's an empirical claim, but it's fundamentally a kind, it goes back to, to these questions. I mean, he, I think he would say that Russia, because it's all circular. I mean, Russian history has best prepared us for fascism, but his account of Russian history is entirely based upon these a priori notions, right? So it's all really circular. So I think he would have said in his better days that I think Russian fascism would be pure, but I understand if other people think their own fascism. Would be, would be purer. The Europe that he's looking forward to in 1954 is a kind of commonwealth of, of fascist states. Every, like Salazar and Franco are going to show the way. So this is another example of him admiring foreigners, right? He doesn't have any problem with that. Thank you very much for coming this evening. <laughs> Thank you, guys.